when my sisters asked me to do this, it was kind of, they weren't going to ask me at first because they have a bunch of little kids and they didn't think that I was probably going to have time to do it, but they couldn't find anybody else, so. <laughs> um, but when they asked me to do this, um, God started giving me all these different ideas uh, and I started writing things down. And then I remembered that I had this book that someone had given me, I think actually at one of these retreats. So some of you might have also had this book if you were at that same, same yeah. retreat. Um, so I started reading this. It's kind of a shame I hadn't started reading it before, but um, this was a good prompt for me. So I started reading it and I was like, every almost every point that I had thought of, she had in here plus a whole lot more. So I'm going to use her book kind of as an outline today. Um, some of the points that she had that I hadn't thought of. Um, and I can also draw on her 44 years of marriage instead of my almost 10. Um, so there's a little more experience behind um, her book. Um, but anyway, so I want to start first with praying and then we'll go to some scripture here. ladies and um, all the encouragement that we've been gathering from everyone and I just praise you for your your work that you're doing in the lives of all of the women here and all of their families and we pray that we could learn how to better minister to our husbands and our families and um, glorify you through through our work there um, please be with me as I speak today and give me the words that uh, you want me to say, and that I would have clarity of mind to share what you've shown me. Um, all right, Genesis 2.18, I want to start with. And it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Um, and 1 Corinthians 11.9, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. God created you to be the perfect person for your husband. Um, he didn't give him any other woman, he gave him you. So he gives, will give you the strength to do everything that he wants you to do, um, that your, your specific husband needs. Um, in Ephesians 5.22, God tells us, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. Uh, and that should be our motivation in ministering to our husband, is that we're doing it to serve the Lord. Um, it's not because he's, our husband is worthy necessarily or because just because we love him, but we should be doing it as unto the Lord. It's Proverbs 14, verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Um, so the first point on your outline is about making, making a sanctuary. Um, this is an area where, personally, I'm not naturally inclined um, in making my home a place that is inviting and that my husband will feel is a comfortable place to come to. So that's something that um, I have to work at harder than some women. Um, but just a couple points on this um, is being diligent. The woman in Proverbs 31, she was very diligent. She looked well to the ways of her household. Um, and it is not the bread of idleness. She rides it early while it is yet night. Um, those are some, some things that God shows us about being diligent um, so that we can get to be diligent about cleaning and laundry, preparing meals and things like that that are essential to just our home being a comfortable place for our husband. Um, a couple things about cleaning, planning your cleaning so that you have a schedule that needs to be done when can be helpful in actually making it happen rather than just chaos of uh, sometimes things get cleaned and then you realize, oh, I think it was, you know, three years since I cleaned out under this. <laughs> uh, anyway, another tip on that is having a time um, before your husband gets home at night. Um, if your husband works a you know, typical job, you just have a quick time before he gets home to run around and pick up things and tidy things up a little bit so that it's a little less of a disaster when he gets home. <laughs> Um, also include your children, train them how to clean up so they can be doing that to serve your husband as well and it makes it easier for yourself also. Um, laundry is another area I have on there. Um, 
might not think of that as kind of a mundane task, but that's that is definitely a way that you can serve your husband in keeping him clothed with clean clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, picking up the socks off the floor and watching them is definitely a, a ministry. <laughs> well, I'm putting them away, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. For sure. Um, you might. The next point I have is food. You might have heard the saying that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> you know? um, so preparing food for him and, and uh, finding ways to make nutritious food that's also enjoyable. Um, you know, some of our husbands will eat anything because we think it's the best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> Others, uh, we have to get more creative with how to make something that he will enjoy and eat that's healthy for him. Um, so just kind of learning, learning about that, um, finding a plan of eating that works for you and your family, um, that can be nutritious. Um, and planning, planning those meals in advance can also be helpful so you can have a plan that helps you with a budget and knowing what you're going to make instead of saying, oh dear, he's going to be home in five minutes and I haven't started supper yet. Uh, which, yeah, I'm guilty of that one too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we all have. Uh, another one I have on there is beauty in the home. And you might not think of beauty in your home as something your husband cares about. I mean, most of the time, they're not all, like, you don't care what color the picture is on the wall. But that womanly touch does a lot for making your home a place that he feels comfortable and welcome. Um, so do, do pay attention to what you're doing in your decorating so that it is a welcoming, comfortable place for him to live. Um, and then also, um, ministering at home. Um, if we're so focused on, you know, might be perfectly good things if we're helping at church all the time, or we're doing this and we're going here and we're doing that, but we're not at home, it's going to be a lot harder for us to do all of these things um, that we need to do to serve our husbands. And Titus 2, 4 through 5 says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And that verse shows that the job of the wife is ministering to her family at home. Um, it's not to say she can't do anything that's not in the home, but that is her first priority. Uh, first Timothy 5.10 also talks about it. It talks about the women, the wo widows, I'm sorry, the widows who were reported of for good works. That she have brought up children, that she have lodged strangers, that she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Most of those good works are in the home, or at least start in the home, you know, raising your children, um, being hospitable, all of those things are home based ministries um, that God calls us to as women. So the next, um, the next topic is uh, nurturing yourself for him. Investing in yourself as your husband's help me is actually ministering to him. Um, so there's four, there's four areas that we're going to look at. Your spiritual life, sleep, exercise, and nutrition. It's Proverbs 31, 29-30. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Spending time in God's word will equip you with the joy and the peace that you need to be able to minister to your family. If you're not spending that time in God's word, you're not going to have, like we talked about today, your cup can be filled, filled to pour out to others. So, making that time, even if you have to sacrifice other things, it's a very important part of being able to minister. Sleep. Um, Mindy also mentioned sleep. Uh, and I know for myself, if I don't get enough sleep, I'm not really a decent human. So <laughs> I, have to, I really have to prioritize getting enough sleep. But uh, most of us are kind of difficult if we don't, don't get enough sleep. So figuring out things that you can maybe choose to sleep instead of doing something else. Um, and there are seasons where you're just not going to get enough sleep. <laughs> but but things like Mindy talked about, you know, when you do have a newborn, having hopefully other people that can come alongside and help you get that sleep, um, scheduling things that you can find time to sleep. Um, exercise is another one. Proverbs 31:17 says 
says, She girded her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. 1 Timothy 4 8. For bodily exercise profited little. Um, living a long, healthy, and productive life, it, we have to exercise or we won't be able to do that um, if we're not able to function because we're so out of shape that we can't even you know, keep up with our children. <laughs> it's not very, very easy to minister to them. Um, a few things you could do, I mean, even just if you go on a walk a few times a week with your children, or um, it can be a good time to talk with your husband, or go on a walk and let the kids burn off those wiggles and get your blood moving. Um, also, you know, if you couldn't do something like that on a daily basis, if you had something a little more, maybe a little more strenuous that you did just a few times a week, mm -hmm. just set that time aside to, to do the exercise. Um, next is diet. What we put into our body affects our ability, like with exercise, to minister. If we're overweight, if we're um, having heart issues because we're putting things into our body that don't nourish us but actually cause us to be sluggish and um, unhealthy, then we're not able to minister to others because we're having to take care of survival <laughs> ourselves. Um, so, just like with serving your husband's food, figure out what you should be eating as well. And then scheduling. Scheduling can help with all of those nurturing items. You know, if you can plan all, plan your life so that you can have somewhat of a schedule. Maybe not your life, plan your day. <laughs> so you can have somewhat of a schedule so that you can accomplish the things that are needed. In your day. It also helps save you time, save you from time that's wasted because. If you know, well, now I need to do this, you're less likely to be, you know, just scrolling Facebook or, you know, wasting time because you have something that you need to do and you know, you know what it is. Um, and if, if some of this sounds overwhelming, don't feel like, oh, I have to change my whole life, I have to do all these things tomorrow. Um, you know, you can tackle just one thing at a time. You know, maybe just look at, okay, I'm going to start with exercise and we're going to work on that this month and maybe the next month we're going to work on something else. But, just kind of take it, you know, whatever you can, piece by piece. Um, the next is loving him. Have any of you ever read the book Five Love Languages? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Gary Chapman. Yep. Can you, you tell me what the five love languages are? Words of affirmation. Color service. Physical touch. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, not all of us. Like appreciate love the same way, so kind um, of right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Some people might be like, "That was nice that somebody gave me a gift, but does it really mean that much to them?" Whereas other people feel really loved when they are given a gift, you know. And so, kind of learning what your husband's love language or languages are um, can be helpful. And sometimes you might ask them, and they say, oh, "It doesn't matter." Anything. I love anything you do, honey. Um, <laughs> you know, but if you observe him, you may be able to kind of find what, you know, what he seems to like the best. Um, Oftentimes when people, their love languages actually come out by what they tend to do. Yes, from. yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of get it. Mm -hmm. yep. If he's always giving you flowers, maybe you should give him flowers. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, but then he's probably a gift giver. Next is choosing to love him. Sometimes we might not feel very loving to our husbands. Um, maybe it's the time of month you don't feel like loving him very much. Or maybe it's how he's been acting and you're like, I just can't love this guy today. Um, but love is a choice. Um, and we think about how God chose to love us. You know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he chose to love us. And we can make that same choice to, to love our husbands. Um, regardless of how he is or how we're feeling. Um, that's something very important. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. We read all of those verses. It's not too long. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unfeeling. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, 
believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. If we can follow after charity, we will love our husbands perfectly. We can do what that verse says. Um, do you want to break down those verses a little bit? Uh, we have being long-suffering, kind, and not easily provoked. Patience. Patience can be especially hard for us as wives. Um, when we struggle to be patient when they don't do things the way we think they should do it or when they, we think they should do it. Um, or maybe he's not growing spiritually like we expect him to. But having patience for that is, is very important. It will help him to feel loved and appreciated when you can be patient with him. When those are when you really like it. Um, not vaunting, not envying, and not being puffed up is humility. Proverbs 13.10 Only by pride cometh contention. Um, I always think of that one whenever there is contention. You know, there's pride somewhere. Proverbs 28.25 he that is of a proud heart stirs up strife. And James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And humility is the opposite of pride. So leaving our pride behind and serving in humility, we minister to our husbands more than if we're standing in our own pride. So we want to make our marriage better by being humble make our husband's lives better as well. When charity behaveth not unseemly, not seeking your own and not thinking evil, we see unselfishness. Putting our, our husband's desires above ours is being unselfish. 1 Corinthians 7, 34. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be, be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Um, I want to read a couple, or a little list from this book here, Mrs. Maxwell's book, with examples from some ladies um, on how they serve their husbands. Bless them in some just some practical ideas that other women have found helpful. I tried to make sure he never has to go get his own drink or of water or whatever. I try to notice if it is almost empty and ask him if he would like a refill. I serve him his plate of food first at meals. I lay his clothes out for him the night before. He has to dress nightly and he hates looking for something to wear. I try to have it all pressed and a matching tie on the hanger too. I never talk badly about him ever, no matter what. When I'm done washing, drying, and folding the clothes, I put them away. For my husband, this is an extra he really appreciates. I leave him notes in unexpected places pants, pockets, lunch cooler, etc. The notes say things like, you're the best. Thanks for all you do. I miss you every day. Can't wait for you to be home from work. I'm praying for you. Have a super day. Getting my husband's morning coffee is a blessing to him. It is so much fun for me to bless my husband. He has a sweet tooth, so I try to fill it with nutritionally superior goodies, which he loves. I constantly remind him of how very thankful I am for him. I appreciate that he provides for our family and how wonderful he is. I really try to make sure I do whatever he mentions that needs to be done because he rarely asks me to do anything for him. My husband likes it when I call him during the day, out of the blue, just to say, I love you or I miss you. He told me that that makes him feel special. I make bread from freshly milked flour because my husband loves it. I try to always have some freshly baked goodies around for him and ask him what he would like me to bake. I always say I love you whenever we are parting. I make the phone calls he asks me to make. I send out birthday cards and such to his family members. Because my husband has trouble getting up on time in the morning, I set an alarm to make sure I get up and then make sure he gets up on time. I purchased a small whiteboard and hung it by the back door. It is for his use only. I asked him to write extra things on it he would like me to accomplish each day, such as phone calls, research, or errands. I have a visual reminder of what he needs and he is confident it will be done when he gets home. If I can't finish it that day, I'll call and ask him if it can be delayed. I put a small basket in our bathroom with two mini notebooks and a pen in it. One notebook is for him and the other is for me. I try to write a note on each page and date it. I try to do this at least twice a week. I write things about appreciating something he's done, like taking out the trash, or share my admi admiration for character traits that I see in him. I call him when I'm going to be late. Dinner is always on the table at six at his request. 
I respect my husband's opinion and opinions and wisdom. So obviously some of those might not be applicable for your husband and your marriage, but it just kind of gives you a few ideas of things that other women have found helpful for, for their marriage. Um, it's easy to fall into a rut, kind of just the daily ins and outs and all the things that need to be done. So we need to be purposeful in our marriage and serving our husband, not just kind of going along and surviving. Um, but when it does get to be too much and we feel like we can't do it all, we need to make sure that we're drawing on the Lord for that strength and asking Him um, to give us the strength and power that we need to do that. Next is um, praying for Him. That's on page number two. Philippians 4, 6-7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ through Christ Jesus. Prayer is probably one of the most powerful ways of ministering to your husband that there is. I'm going to pray for God's will to be done in decisions and in your husband's life. Um, sometimes your husband might want to do something that you have talked about before and you don't feel like that's what God wants to do. Like maybe it's around debt or schooling or finances or something like that. Um, and it's okay, you know, to have discussions with your husband when you dis disagree and tell him where you're coming from. Um, but once he knows your heart, let him make, make the decision. Don't sit there and nag him about it and, you know, constantly uh, bother him about it. Go to take it to the Lord and let him convict your husband about it. Um, if it's something that you feel strongly about or you know, maybe it's something a little more minor. But just kind of, it's, it's hard, but trust, trust the Lord for that take it to him. Um, and when you're praying, evaluate your motives uh, around praying for your husband. Be praying for God's will and for him to be conformed to the image of Christ, not because it's something that, things that you want. You know, it shouldn't be about you or what you're praying for. It shouldn't be because you want something, but rather because you want him to be more like Christ. Um, one of the most powerful things is praying scripture over your husband. I want to read Colossians 1, 9 through 11. This is a really great example of a verse to pray over your husband. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. A prayer like that is powerful for your husband. Can you imagine having to pray over him? There's Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, Colossians 3, 17. Um, there's tons more, but that's all I have time to, to hunt up and write down. Um, but there's, there's many like that. Um, and when you are praying, again, you know, make sure that you're not having a critical or condescending spirit towards your husband. Try to focus on the positive traits that you appreciate rather than, oh, change this and fix that. You know, he's got all these problems I want God to fix, you know. Um, you know build them up, too. Um, and then keep praying for your marriage, too. Praying for your husband is important, but praying for your marriage as a whole. Um, there's a bunch in your handout from Mrs. Maxwell's book, um, a list of things. I can go through those here. I wasn't sure if we would have time, but I think I talked too fast, and so we do. <laughs> um, pray that your marriage will be a picture of Christ and the church as God designed. Pray that it will be a testimony to your children and to the world. Pray that your marriage will flourish and grow. Pray that you will both be quick to forgive. We talked about in the Bible study, I think, in our group, about bear and forbear. Um, pray that you will be unified in heart and soul. Pray for outreach opportunities. Pray that you will be drawn closer together. Pray for God's protection because the devil hates marriage. Ask him to help you to lighten each other and not to annoy each other. And I'm sure you can think of lots more to pray for your marriage, but that's just a starting point. Um, and then pray for yourself because we need God's strength to be a godly wife. So you want to ask him for the strength, the power, the perseverance to be a godly wife. Um, next is following your husband. 
Ephesians 5.23 For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. If we want our husbands to be leaders in the spiritual things in our lives, we need to also follow him in the little things that seem smaller. Um, respecting your husband through following him. Ephesians, the end of Ephesians 5.33 says, And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Um, I have the definition for reverence. Uh, is to regard with reverence, to regard with fear mingled with respect and affection. So we're going to be following, like, like when we're following the Lord, we need to follow our husbands. And it shows them that we have respect for them. It shows that we love them. It shows that we trust them. Um, and that we have reverence for them. And this is especially true when it's something that you don't necessarily like, <laughs> you know, uh, when you can follow in a way that maybe isn't the decision that you would have made, but you choose to follow anyway. Um, you know, giving up our way shows respect for your husband. And then, is your husband worthy of respect that God asks you to give him? I'm going to answer that with another question. Are we worthy of having our husbands give their lives for us? The answer to both is no. But just like we talked about earlier, God commands us still to do that. Just like when we were not worthy, he gave himself for us. So we're still to respect our husbands even when they don't deserve it. You know, mm -hmm. or they haven't earned it. Um, we want to start to create an atmosphere where our husband is comfortable coming to us and asking for advice. Where he feels safe to make that decision. Uh, if every time he comes to us and asks for our advice and we... Uh, give it and then he makes a decision and we're constantly why did you do that and questioning it um, or if he makes a bad decision and we constantly bring it up to him and say well remember that time when you did this decision and now look what happened he's not going to you know the, the, I just told you so kind of a, a thing that doesn't, doesn't help matters and he won't feel comfortable with even getting your advice um, you want that to be a trust relationship where he trusts us and we trust him and we go forward and make a decision together and he we trust his decision um, but we can make it make it a lot worse when we're constantly bringing up past mistakes because everyone makes mistakes I mean I don't know about you but I'm not sure <laughs> so there's our husband and he's gonna make mistakes and he doesn't want to make mistakes you know I mean I don't think any of our husbands want to make mistakes so when they do make mistakes Know, let it be gone. Um, Psalm 103:12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has hath he removed our transgressions for us. So let's follow the Lord's example and put our husband's transgressions or our mistakes and failures behind us, and just leave them leave them in the past. <laughs> um, another one is arguing not when he does make the decision. We just covered that a little bit, but don't. Don't try to convince him that your way is right um, or argue with it. You know what it feels like when a child, you tell a child to do something, and you're like, oh, Mom, we need to do it this way. Or argue. You don't want to argue with you. You don't feel very respected by that child. And our husband must not feel very respected when we argue with him either. Um, and then another one um, on page three, following or pushing. Sometimes we'll think we're following, but we're really just like, she came in front of us and then we're, we're right behind you, honey. Go away. <laughs> uh, that, that's not true following. Um, and then this one, to be careful with this one, is accepting counsel. So men naturally want to fix things. You know, they want to make everything better and fix the problem. So we can honor them and show them love by bringing them problems and letting them solve them. But make sure that once he gives you the solution, you accept it. And you don't, you know, reject his counsel or his his solution, and then want to do it your own way. Because then, just don't ask. <laughs> um, but that can be a way to make them to feel loved. Uh, and then another one is changing loyalty. This is especially for young wives, but for every wife. Um, you know, when you leave your parents' house and you go with your husband, he's your leader now. He's the head of your home. Not your dad or your mom or your you know, traditions that you had growing up. Um, and so 
making that change in loyalty to following your husband and what he wants and his his choices rather than going back to mom and dad and you know even sometimes there might be things where there's disagreements and you when you have to choose a side you have to choose to follow your husband um, not following people and again in the Lord I'm not talking about you know sinful things or anything like that but <laughs> or you know if you did little traditions one way or or even just you know choosing to spend time with your husband when you could maybe be spending time with mom and dad and he needs you go with him or <laughs> this is a funny one my mom was telling me this when I was talking with her and she had one of these where um, her dad had a very particular way that he wanted his underwear folded <laughs> and when she got married dad wanted her to fold it a totally different way and it was like for some reason a big deal to both men how their underwear was folded <laughs> and so she was constantly like folding wait no that's the wrong way <laughs> you know just because she wanted to do it the way dad wanted her to do it so it was kind of a funny uh, funny uh, yeah <laughs> a funny way so <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny um, and then another one is what if he doesn't leave aren't really wanting to lead their, their family. Um, and one thing to think about as a wife is, is it because of me that he's not wanting to lead? Because oftentimes, um, I have in there too some of the questions from Mrs. Maxwell's book in your handout, um, but about things to think about, just evaluating yourself. Because obviously, you can't make him leave, but there are things you can do to hinder him being able to leave. Um, it says, how are you responding to your husband? Are you following him? Do you disagree with him? Do you criticize his decisions? Can his heart safely trust in you, like the Proverbs 31? The Proverbs 31, a woman's husband. That sounds odd. <laughs> but I said, or does he think you might use bad decisions against him and criticize his decisions um, and question him? So those are those are things to evaluate ourselves with. Um, and then kind of continuing on the, some of the don't do list is um, hindering. Um, Proverbs 25, 24 says, it is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Uh, this one is one that I've been guilty of <laughs> too many times, is correcting. So if your husband is telling about something and he says, well, four years ago, do you say, honey, it was five? Um, we were out in Montana, it was Wyoming, um, we did such and such, and you know, just correcting little details that really aren't important. I mean, I'm not talking about he's giving your child four tablespoons of medicine, it should only be one, okay? <laughs> um, but, you know, things that it really doesn't matter, what, what the difference is, because um, it, it really comes down to pride, you know, I know the story better, um, he's wrong, I'm right. And, it, it tears him down, it belittles him in front of other people, um, or just to himself, if it's just the two of you talking. Um, and it, it can just, it can really be hurtful to your, to your husband. Um, so, if, unless he's asking you, you know, do you remember when that was, or what state were we in? Now, obviously that's fine, but don't, don't interrupt him to correct him. Um, which leads to the next one is interrupting, which is similar to correcting, um, but it's more, you know, kind of interrupting him and then maybe continuing the story or telling the rest of the story when he was in the middle of something or, you know, not also about stories, but that's, you know, again, just not trusting your husband to communicate well. And it's communicating to him, I don't trust your communication skills. I think I know more than you or I'm better at telling things. And it's not, um, it's not ministering to him well. Uh, and then another one is better ideas. If your husband has an idea and, you know, maybe he wants to go somewhere or do something and you're like, oh, that's a great idea. Well, let's do this and this and this. And you basically take over his idea. It's not his idea anymore. Now it's your idea. Um, or maybe you, he says, well, let's have this. And you say, no, I want to do it differently. Or something like that. Sarai is the example that um, is in here uh, in your 
You know, it's in Genesis 16.1. She's an example of a biblical wife, wife with a better idea. God told Abram that he was going to have a child with his wife Sarai, and she had a better idea. <laughs> now Sarai, Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So Abraham, Abram, at the time, Abraham later, had trusted God for that child. And Sarah doubted. And Sarah, Sarah said, well, here, let's, i got a better idea. Let's do it this way. And we know that resulted in pain and suffering. Um, I mean, conflict for generations, you know. We still see that, the results of that today. Um, so letting him have his ideas. Another one is mothering. As mothers were to guide and train our children, and we'll ask them questions like, did you do your homework? Did you, you know, do your job of sweeping the floor or whatever it is? We'll kind of ask them questions to make sure that they're doing what's, what they're supposed to do. Um, husbands, we can fall into the same habit with our husbands. We'll be like, honey, did you pay the taxes? Did you, you know, did you check the oil on the car yet? Um, you know, did you send your mother a birthday card? <laughs> you know, different things like that where you're, you're kind of mothering him. Did you eat the salad I sent you for lunch? Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're not his calendar reminder or his, you know, he could set a calendar reminder to pay the taxes or whatever. Um, it's doubting his, his ability. You know, now if he asks you to, to remind you, I mean, my husband needs me to remind him of things and wants me to tell him things like that. So I'm not saying you can never tell him something, but just do it with, you know, and know your husband if he wants you to help him with things like that. But don't do it in a mothering way where you're you're not trusting his ability as a man to be a man and do do man's work. Um, like a, a good friend of mine from the Philippines, she said it was it was you know she she always said don't be a nagger, <laughs> don't be a nagger. So, um, which leads me to our next topic, which is dripping. And Proverbs 27, 15. A continual dropping in a rainy, very day, and a contentious woman are alike. So we're going to watch a video. So let's look at some tips to not be a drippy wife. <laughs> Right? <laughs> um, okay, complaining. Think about your words. Are they positive or negative? Are they fault finding or are they encouraging? Rather than complaining, find the positive things to praise and encourage your husband. Uh, Philippians 4 8. This verse, you just go through this verse every day over and over and make it your focus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's dwell on the positive, edifying things in our lives and in our husbands. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. When we complain, we're showing discontent. And uh, Hebrews 13, 5, the second half of it, says to be content with such things as you have. Criticizing, um, criticizing, com the complaining focus is on your circumstances. Uh, and, and I put definitions, I'm not going to read them all, but I put definitions in your handout. Um, so you can look over those at your leisure. Uh, but anyway, the, the criticizing is directed at your husband himself. So the complaining is more about circumstances or like things that are going on and criticizing is more about him. Points out what he did wrong, traits that you don't like about him, you know, uh, maybe you're complaining, well, they were criticizing. <laughs> Eating food and leaving socks on the floor. Uh, so pointing those traits out constantly isn't good for him or for you. So dwell on his good points rather than his than criticizing him. Nagging. Honey, just do the honey do. Constant nagging about doing certain things or changing habits. And, uh, 
It doesn't show love to our husband. It shows that you're unsatisfied with him and that you're, you're unhappy. It gives him more cause to be bitter against us. Controlling. Uh, many of the topics we covered are controlling your husband. And we try to make certain things happen. What you want them to happen is controlling. And it says in Proverbs 17, 1, Better is a dry morsel of fineness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Many men will rather, would rather give up the control and the leading than to have to fight their wife over it all the time. Not all men, some men will fight to the end for being able to lead, but other men will just say, fine, if you want to lead, go ahead, lead, I, won't, I, don't, want to, I don't want that contention. Um, and then, then you're stuck, well, if I want to lead, how can I follow? Well, I have to do it for ourselves sometimes. Um, but we need to trust the Lord first of all, and then trust Him that He will help our husbands. And we can give up that control, that need for control, because we're trusting the Lord, not trusting him. Just trusting the husbands, we're trusting the Lord. If that makes sense. <laughs> so. and then another one is talking about him. Proverbs 11.22 says, As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman, which is without discretion. Rather graphic description. Um, but when we talk badly about our husbands to others, it's a shame and a reproach. Proverbs 12.4 says, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness to his bo- to his bo- in his bones. Sorry, as rottenness in his bones. Talking about our husband's faults and his shortcomings or even his sins to others, it's not only unhelpful to us and to others, but it tears him down and it causes shame uh, to him. So let's find positive things to talk about our husbands. Like, like they had us do when we first got here, going around and sharing things that we appreciate about our husband. Because everyone can find something about their husband to be thankful for. And it says in Proverbs 15, 2, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge of right, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And then the next section is, Is he bitter? It says in Colossians 3, 19, Husbands, love your wives. And be not bitter against them. Why do you think God had to tell husbands not to be bitter against their wives? It's because that's a temptation for them. And there are things we can do that can make that easier for them or harder for them. Um, just like sometimes our husbands can be easier to be respectful of. And others, other times that's harder. We can do the same for our husbands, making it way harder to be not bitter against us. Or making it really easy to be bitter. So let's try to make it so that it's easier for him. And then the last section is about building him up. Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. And Proverbs 31, 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is a lot of kindness. So as wives, we can use our words to either tear him down, as we talked about in the previous section, or we can build him up and we can edify him. We can encourage him. We can strengthen him. We can give him the support that he needs with our words. Our tongues are so powerful to either destroy or to build up. So we want to focus on using our words well. Um, Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Corrupt words are rotten or worthless, and we want to use our tongues to minister grace to our husbands. And we can do things like Eunice's husband does, giving her little notes. <laughs> or we can tell him verbally, we can make him a song to sing him. There's lots of different ways that we can use our, our words to encourage our husbands. Uh, there are a few specific types of edifying words. Uh, again, I have the I have Webster definition in your handout. Um, but I'm just going to kind of go over them quickly. Is I have gratitude. Express your thankfulness to him. Find things about him to be thankful for and tell him. Praise is similar to thankfulness, but these edifying words are more about what he has done. Um, I mean, the right. They're more about what he's done well and why we appreciate it and good character traits. Um, or, yeah, I wanted to go to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, 2. 
Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. So we can be that for our husbands, is be that other tongue that praises him. Encouragement. Webster defines encouragement as the act of giving courage or confidence of success. Imagine a husband whose wife is encouraging him, giving him confidence and success, and making him be courageous. That's a pretty powerful thing, to be able to give our husbands courage through our words. It's, there are a lot of men out there that don't have courage these days, and we can help build that in our husbands. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And following up on a merry heart, smiling. A smile shows joy and contentment. So even if you don't necessarily feel joyful at the moment, um, you can choose joy. Because in Philippians 4.4, 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. We can choose to rejoice and choose to smile and show that rejoicing. Being thankful and choosing to dwell on the positive traits of your husband and praising him can also help you to have that merry heart because you're focusing on the good things rather than focusing on the negative. I, can, I don't think we covered this verse already. Um, Proverbs 15, 13. Oh yeah, it's just similar to the other verse. I'm like, wait, I think I read this. But a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. And lastly, um, be interested. If you've ever been talking to someone and trying to have a conversation with Janet, and she's like, you know, we're going to here, and I'm to watch, figure out if she wants to go start separate yet. And it's, it's just, there's no connection there, and it shows that you don't really care about what your husband's saying if you're not giving him your attention and being interested. And sometimes our husbands have things that they're super passionate about or very interested in that are extremely boring to us. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, you might think, I really don't care how many points we're in that game. But we need to choose to be interested in their interests. You know, maybe we can learn about whatever it is that they're interested in so that we can pay attention when they're talking to us. Um, and... It, it shows them that you love them and you care for them and you're interested in things they're interested in. Just like if they were going to be interested and they would pay attention to your knitting or whatever you're telling them about mm -hmm. because they love you and they care about it. So it can be the same for them. Be interested in them. And what, I mean interested in what they're talking about. Uh, again, that's a lot of topics and different areas. And I don't want you to feel like, oh, I'm a failure, I can't do all of that. Um, I just wanted to encourage you in things to consider and, you know, press towards. Um, but I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. It to feel overwhelming. So just take, take things one, one, maybe one thing at a time. Um, you don't have to build the whole house in one day. So just piece by piece. And also remember that God gave your husband you. He gave you to your husband. And he gives you his word so that you can do what you need and be what your husband needs. Um, it's not just all on your shoulders, but we have the strength of Christ to do all that we need. So uh, I want to end by reading a portion of this book here, My Delight, by Terry Maxwell, on page 85. Uh, it says, What's in the heart? It starts with letting go. We have to decide if we truly want to submit ourselves to God's way and choose to be followers of our husbands. We must come to terms with not having to be in charge and maybe not having things go our way. The bottom line is that we are to rest in the Lord and trust Him. Can we do that with genuine happiness and contentment? If our compliance is outward only, do we, me, do we see that as sin, and are we crying out to the Lord to change it? Do we tolerate our inability to follow by saying, that's just how I am, and I can't change? Truly, one of the greatest indications of respect for a husband is whether his wife will follow him. What wife do you want to be? Do you value being that kind of wife? Will you pray for it, repent when you fail, and put forth effort towards it? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time of gathering and learning from your word so many things that you have in there for us. We just touched on a few, a few of the many, many, many things in your word to strengthen us and encourage us. We ask for strength patience, for wisdom. We ask you, Lord, to 
and guide us and give us all that we need every day to be godly wives and mothers, to be a blessing to our husbands, to be able to minister to them, and that you would just bless our homes, Lord, and help us to live godly in Christ Jesus.